I'm Lynette Nock, and in the next edition of It's About Money, I'll be talking with the good folks at Rochester Chamber Orchestra. I hope you stay tuned in the first part of the series with Rochester Chamber Orchestra. another edition of It's About Money and this is Nanette Nokan. I am privileged to have some wonderful guests from the Rochester Chamber Orchestra and I'd like to welcome them. Starting with Tom Paul, who is the board chair of the Rochester Chamber Orchestra, David Fettler, who is the founding music director of the Chamber Orchestra, and the newly appointed artistic director, a real drummerite. Thank you all for being here. I, I feel privileged to have all three talented gentlemen in front of me here. Thank you. <laughs> Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Uh, Thank you. And so let's start with you, Dr. Fettler. Let's talk about the RCO being founded in 1964. Can you give us a brief history of the organization? Sure. In, in the 1960s, I was on the conducting faculty at Eastman, uh, and uh, I, I was in charge of a whole range of programs, especially the Collegium Musicum, which performed uh, something every week as part of the lecture series of the Collegium Musicum. And it, music went back to the not only Gregorian chant, but early Greek music, and then all the way up to contemporary music. And I had at my disposal uh, players from Eastman, the chamber orchestra, as well as a, a group called the Festival Singers. So we covered a huge amount of repertory of the whole history of music. And uh, uh, some of my colleagues and friends said, well, this is wonderful what you do, but you know, Rochester doesn't have a chamber orchestra. And so they encouraged me to, to start the group with uh, some of my friends and colleagues, and also as well as players from the Rochester Philharmonic. And so we gave our first concert in April of 1964. Th these are all players from the RPO, and we did a program of uh, something contemporary, something classic. We did a Mozart fourth violin concerto with a concert master of the RPO at the time, Miller Taylor. And uh, we also did uh, something more 20th century. We did Stravinsky's Puccinella Suite. And so that was the beginning. And, and uh, uh, I had friends in here who were able to uh, uh, organize a board, and, and uh, uh, we went on from then. Oh, cool. So what is a chamber orchestra for the benefit of our viewers? How would you define a chamber orchestra? Well, the, the chamber orchestra is very similar to a large orchestra. It has uh, strings, winds, uh, brass, percussion. The only thing is there are fewer players. I see. Usually between, anywhere is between 15 to 30 or even it can be more. So the, the repertory, actually the repertory for for chamber orchestra c can be in many ways even wider than for large orchestra because it goes back to the 17th century, 18th century, and there's a great deal of music from that period. You know. mm -hmm. As well as a lot, of, a lot of contemporary composers have written stuff for small orchestra. So basically it's a small orchestra. In New York City there was a, a, a famous group called the Little Symphony of New York. So the Little Symphony of New York was like a chamber orchestra. So I it's see. just like an orchestra on the not as big. <laughs> I see, I see. And then, and Tom, Tom Paul, you've been a renowned best baritone, baritone opera singer for many years. I'm not counting anymore. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how have you been involved with the chamber orchestra? Well, not since the very beginning, but not long thereafter, I came to Rochester to start teaching at the Eastman School. And David and I met up at some point. I guess maybe he heard me and decided he'd give me a shot at a, at a performance one time. And, that was the beginning of a very, very rich collaboration over those many decades with Bach and Mozart and new works composed for us yeah. to perform. And Shostakovich. And Shostakovich and more. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just been a delight for me. Yeah, that, that's, that's fantastic. So, so now you're on the other side. You're not performing with the chamber orchestra these days, but you're on the administration side. Yes, and I, I found out how enabled I was to just show up and sing because other people were working very hard behind the scene. <laughs> now I know what that means. And I, it's a payback period for me. <laughs> and I like it. Yeah. It's gratifying. Yeah. 
And Aurel, you've conducted all over the world and uh, have conducted chamber orchestras and philharmonics. How do you find the difference between the two? Well, it is uh, in many ways um, also a different repertoire. Um, since I've spent half my life in Vienna, I feel especially at home and uh, comfortable uh, in love with the Viennese classics. And actually, the ideal size for uh, performances of Haydn and Mozart and, and also, to some degree, Beethoven, um, is the size of an orchestra. It also indicates, of course, that the halls should not be too big. The chamber is also an indication of, of uh, the environment where you play. So it's kind of, there is something intimate to it. Mm -hmm. um, I have, in my early days in Vienna as a student, I, I, I was actually a co-founder of a, of a little orchestra myself that played for the tourists. And the repertoire uh, was, for the biggest part, Haydn and Mozart. I see. Neat. So it kind of come together. Of course, you needed to give them the Johann Strauss portion of at the course. end. Of course. Yeah, you can't <laughs> be in Vienna without <laughs> Johann Strauss. To <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. That was actually our first concert in Vienna when we visited. It's like, we got to go to Johann Strauss. So, so, you know, we want to talk about the history also. I mean, it's wonderful that the three, three of you come together in, in, in heading up the Rochester Chamber Orchestra. And uh, the, the, the community is very excited about, you know, the, the, the celebration of the 50 years coming Coming up, and then the next 50 years after that. So, how have you how have you kept the organization going over the last 50 years? Well, I've had a good board, uh, wonderful music lovers, and wonderful players who enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, all those things put together uh, kept us going. Has there been a time where you say, mm, we might not be able to do it next year, or has somebody always come through?" Well, I, I remember we did a, we did. A, we were the first, uh, one of the first orchestras in, in the United States to feature uh, the Tchaikovsky winner, American, uh, American violinist who won the first American violinist to win the gold medal in the Tchaikovsky competition, Elmar Oliveira. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard about him, I quickly hired him. And when he came, it was a February. It was the coldest day of the year. Mm. We hired the Eastman Theater. And of course, the place was not full mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the weather, you know. And by the next morning review, uh, hailed it as a great concert in spite of the weather. So yes. uh, we lost money on that concert, but we had a we had a wonderful uh, group, volunteer group, who went after and raised money to take care of the deficit. So uh, we were fortunate with. The, the people we have on our board and the uh, music lovers who supported us. So what you're really saying is that in order to have good music for that kind of length of time, you have to have different players, and, and besides the musical players, you know, music players, but, you know, like uh, the board um, uh, supporters, Support the patrons. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. What, da what David isn't saying, I guess he couldn't say it, but I can say it, that this is sustainable because of his great taste and knowledge and good ear for talent. And you put that to great effect here by engaging some of the up and coming young stars at the Eastman graduate level who are just on the verge of walking out the door and beginning a lustrous career. But you have the Midas touch, I think. You just, everything you do turns to gold because of your taste and your knowledge. Thank you. And I've been a beneficiary of that myself. Very I can nice. speak to it. <laughs> that's great. So you've collaborated many years. Yeah, many decades. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's terrific. So, um, so it, when you uh, were getting involved in being a part of the organization, was, what was the, it that intrigued you the most or pulled you the most towards the Rochester Chamber Orchestra? Well, uh, again, the repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, um, I felt very good about uh, the support this organization showed to me uh, as a Rochesterian uh, in, a, in a peculiar time of my life. And uh, also the members of the orchestra um, are, are really musicians that I, I respect and, and, and love. I, I think they are wonderfully talented. So we had this um, concert together, 
it was basically a, a reach out from, from David and, and Tom uh, asking, can we do something together? Uh, and we did, and it's actually one of the most memorable uh, concerts I have ever participated in. And, and then came the conversation, could we do more? Um, and uh, it's very important for me that everybody knows that I, I would have no ambitions uh, to involve myself in this orchestra that has such a great leader uh, already, uh, unless David would have said, what about you um, take it, take, taking it from here, or helping, helping him taking it from here, uh, which was um, uh, something that felt just right for me now. That's great. Your 50 years is a long time. I've been in business for 30 years. I plan to work another 20 because yeah. I'm inspired by your 50 <laughs> record. But has there been a time where you say, okay, I'm giving up. I'm throwing my... Well, we've had ups and downs, you know, sure. uh, because of the economy and stuff like that. But, <clears throat> but it's, it's the love of music and the response I get from the orchestra and um, the friends of the orchestra that made the difference. Mm -hmm. So, But I think 50 years is a, a good good uh, time to step back a little bit. I still plan to do some of the you know, Messiah concerts, but, but uh, otherwise uh, I think it's wonderful to have an a experienced uh, leader like uh, Maestro Remorite uh, continue this tradition. That's fantastic. I say amen to that. Yeah, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> it's, it's smart, I think, to have a transition plan, and yeah, Certainly. 50 years is really phenomenal. So have you always done Messiah every year from the beginning? Uh, not at the very beginning, uh, but uh, the last, uh, what's well, maybe the last 15, 20 years. Oh, nice. It's a nice tradition. Uh, and I do it a certain way uh, that most uh, groups don't do. Um, and I try to, uh, what I like about it is it's a chamber orchestra. It's not a large orchestra. And a chamber choir called the Festival Singers. So it's, it's a good balance. And it's closer to the Baroque spirit rather than, I mean, I mean, even though Handel had big performances with large groups, the, the ideal Baroque style is more transparent, and that's what I like about it. And another thing I do that's different, I feature uh, a wonderful children's chorus, the Bach children's chorus, and they do two arias, and then they do, of course, they join in the Alleluia chorus, and where is a lamb. Uh, so this is variety, and the reason I chose the Bach children's chorus is, again, because of their clear voice, you know, clear light voice rather than a big operatic voice. I see. I see. So that, that's one of my favorite things that I do. So your musicians are professional musicians from the community? They're all from the Philharmonic. Okay, but occasionally you have some students also. No, no, no. no. Well, okay. yeah, a few students from the Eastman. Okay, yeah. from the Eastman. So they, and they, have, they have to be union members. They, yeah, right, they're all union players. I see. So, and then what about the festival singers? Who are those? Those are the singers that I pick ah. every year. They're from all over town. I see. You so know, people that I've known over the years and, and from different church choirs and from different, but I limit, it's about a 40 voice choir. I see. And, and those are people who come and perform only for the Messiah. Yeah, I yeah. See, for this. Specific to that. Occasionally um, I you know, would plan something else, but mainly it's the Messiah. I see. Because they're all very busy and, and uh, they like the way I do it and we just have, uh, you know, uh, maybe three, four rehearsals and that's it. I see. But they're all familiar with it because the Oratorio Society in Rochester also used to do the Messiah uh, for many years. And, and then, of course, there are also singers in the Eastman School called the Eastman Rochester Chorus. And some of those singers sing the Messiah with me and, and some of the Oratorio too. I see. But, but mostly these are people that I've known personally. We'll take a quick break. It's been an exciting conversation. We'll, we'll, we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Before a disaster turns your family's world upside down, it's up to you to be ready. Get a kit. Make a plan. Be informed today. Learn how at ready.gov. And we're back. I'm Nanette Nocken, it's about money, and we're here talking about the Rochester Chamber Orchestra. We're talking about the past 50 years, and my guests are Tom Paul, David Fettler, and a real drummerite. Thank you again for being here. So, um, when you um, started singing for the orchestra, how do you, how do you balance, like, 
because orchestra is in town, but then you sang all over the world, right? How how do you connect that? Do you how does the scheduling work? I guess what I'm alluding to is that uh, many of the performers also perform for other um, events, other groups. How do you manage the scheduling? I mean, do you do you coordinate first and say, okay, I'm available, and then how how does that all magically work? Well, we always hope to hear the phone ring first of all, and then hopefully it's an, an invitation to sing a work that is either new or something you want to do. And then you check the date. And then you look, in my case, look at your teaching obligations, because they always weigh heavily into whatever I was able to do. And when I was just singing and traveling, that was easy. I had family, of course, but on the other hand, I didn't have to report anywhere to keep a teaching schedule. That was my biggest challenge, was to coordinate all that and then the coming and going of it and being true to the obligation with the uh, students as well. Sure. But it worked out okay. You just keep running as fast as you can. <laughs> I know that. So, so Tom, when you, were, uh, when you were traveling a lot, did you already teach? No, I didn't. Uh, I coached people mm. informally maybe, but not in a career sense at all. And I was, uh, I guess I could give credit to the Aspen Music Festival for that because we served there the nice long summers in the, in the mountains there with a very illustrious faculty artist uh, component. And that's where I guess I started. It's a good question. That's where you know my uncle, right? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> very much so. I have an uncle. <clears throat> in, in the, it was a musician. Yeah, he's a musician. A master trombonist, and, and we, we clicked right away. We connected <laughs> over a, a Heinrich Schütz piece that involved trombones, multiple trombones, and uh, it was one of my favorite Baroque, early Baroque pieces. So we got off to a great start together. We've been nice. friends ever since. But what I was leading up to saying briefly was that uh, we became artist teachers at that point. That was my first mixing up performing pure and simple with taking on other things. And it was great because we had wonderful students coming in from all over the place. And it inspired me to create a Bach aria study class and things that I'd never only dreamed of, perhaps, but hadn't started yet. So that was really the beginning. You hark back for me there. I, I can see it crystal clear now that that's how it all started. And I got a call one time from Eastman School, their primary um, Wagnerian Met Opera star baritone had just passed away. Mm. And I was invited to come and jump in and do a visiting pr 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 professorship. We lived in New York City area then. So I was on the airplane back and forth lots. I see. And that first stage, two years of visiting, and then they said, well, you want to make this real and, and move up here? And I looked around this lovely area and the farmland and everything. I said, of course. Oh, how neat. So that's how it all came to, came to bear. Oh, that's great. It's a great <laughs> story. So then how do you manage that? You, not only, you mean you have a lot of people to organize. I mean, in Messiah, you have like, what, 70 people? <laughs> but then in other concerts, how do you, how do you manage all the musicians coming? Because they're not full-time employees at all. You just have to contract them, right? Yeah, but most of them are the same players. I see. Okay, so yeah, there's a court I just, group. I just you know, give, yeah, call them and give them a date. And, and uh, if one day doesn't work, then I have to get another date. And, but it, it's tricky because it's, Rochester has a lot of music. Mm -hmm. Not only uh, in the Philharmonic, but also in the Eastman School. <clears throat> and uh, the, the, one of the trick is to find, uh, <clears throat> to find the availability of the venue. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to Kilburn Hall, the Holstein Music School are, are the two best venues for, for chamber orchestra. I see. So I always try to call them ahead of time and see if they can save this time. So, it, t it takes a lot of work, but, but uh, because uh, I'm pretty much familiar now with all the people, it, it's, it's easier to accomplish. I see. It's great. But it's creating that bond, bond with the musicians. Right. And My main thing is to, to uh, get all the schedules and then coordinate it. <clears throat> I want to add to that how impressed I am that David is and has um, been doing all this, because th these are really very complex logistical issues that mm -hmm. you need to deal with. And uh, you see this organization is, um, is in many ways very small. There is no administration. Yeah. So the administration is really um, the board. And of course, what I understand is that David has been uh, covering uh, 
a big percentage of the administrative uh, duties. <laughs> duties himself. Um, and I'm very impressed with that because this requires skills um, way beyond mus musical ones. Right, because besides being the music director, you're also the orchestra manager, personnel manager, you're the librarian. Well, <laughs> it's a small orchestra. Right, right, right. But it's still a lot of different functions. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's terrific. And we don't have a, you know, a 50 concert season. <laughs> yeah, right, still. And in how many concerts does the chamber orchestra usually do? Well, we used to, at, we used to do four or five. In the last few years, it's been three. This past year, uh, it was four. And uh, we're planning four this coming season. So it's, it's manageable. Yeah, well, that's good. Maybe more. Maybe more. Yeah. Okay. Four, maybe more. Maybe. Right. Oh, there you go. Yeah, four and, and possibly more. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> Surprise is coming up. Okay, all right, that's fantastic. So what, what, what do you see, Thomas, the role of the board? I mean, the board is a working board, right? I mean, yes. What, what, what do you see as, uh, how does it uh, work with the music side of it? And you've, you are, you've been in both sides of the fence. How, how do you find, because you're newly appointed, February of 2013, you were appointed, right, as board chair? It's called on-the-job training. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still young at it, let's say. But I'm surrounded by very caring people. And the delegation of different tasks and areas of, of cooperation is still before me. I'm, I've entered that world, but I'm not really totally adept yet. So I don't know. I'm not sidestepping your question, but I, I'm just saying that I've yet a lot to learn about delegating and to understand clearly how certain tasks can be isolated and assigned and carried out. So in the interim, I do everything that I can, and I have been very busy on many different levels. And I started wondering about that, and then it occurred to me, you know, this is good. I'm learning all the nitty-gritty details, then I know how to assign them, because I know what they are. Sure, that's right. So that's sort of, I'm in transition myself at this time. I see. So it's the 50 years is kind of the ground is moving, but it's, it's good. It's all good, right? Oh, it's in flux for sure. Yeah, that's <laughs> in right. In a good sense. Because right. even your box office is a volunteer position, right? The box yeah. office. And There's another 50-year record of achievement right yeah, there. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, Julie Dozier is not here with us, but she's been running the box office for a long time. That's right. Yeah. From the very beginning. The whole time. The whole time. <laughs> right. Oh, but what a, their credit's been, it's been amazing how that's done, because these days there's the computer to be able to buy tickets and things like that. But then early on, I'm sure it was a little bit tougher. So That's right. Very yeah. true. Well yeah. put. That's great. Sounds like a great group of people to, to who have the same intention, and that's to bring good chamber music to the community. And we're lucky to have a lot of good patrons to enjoy because we need both sides, right? Yeah, I also want to say that Arald has some wonderful ideas of expanding the repertory uh, into a repertory that we don't usually do. Uh, certain thematic ideas, connection of, of uh, uh, different cultures with uh, American culture and so on. And you, I, I know you. Um, when we get the brochure, and you'll know more about it. <laughs> right, right, right. Which, which is great. So it's it's really it's kind of transforming yeah. the organization's transforming to to widen um, the breadth of what it offers to to the music lovers. Yeah, that's great. Well, I I always like to program, believing that one can reach more people. Uh, there are parts of the community also in Rochester that doesn't really know much about what we do, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a challenge, but it's an interesting uh, task to take on to see if we can find ways of being, existing, that uh, make this part of the community feel that we, we are important to them, that we become a part of their lives. So there are, um, uh, I always like to look at the, the very essence of of, of the greatness of a community. And of course, it was easy to me to, to see the spirit of Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass as an inspiration to create seasons. And, and, and um, that's where I'm, I'm heading. So it's from the traditional music and then, all, then carry on history of the community as well. But th these are, I mean, these are personalities that I think should inspire all of us every day because of um, their commitment, their, uh, their greatness. And um, by linking 
that greatness to what we do. We, we would like to tell stories. Uh, I think this could become important to more people. Sure. I mean, what's neat about it is collaborating instead of just, oh, not instead of, it's instead of isolating it to music, you're including other things that are relevant to it, right? So yeah. the history, um, the women composers, which is a big deal. Um, so in other forms of art, which is very nice. I think it's exciting. Before, before we leave that completely, I would like to maybe discuss a little bit, because I hear that in the community, the ask, um, asked question again and again. What, what, is, what is a chamber orchestra? And we talked about it, right, in numbers and all. Because when we say chamber, chamber repertoire, I mean, there are no clear definitions here. I think even, mm -hmm. even the professionals will have a little bit problem saying that's exactly the difference. So many people think that it, it's, it's like we play string quartets and trios and so on, but what we do is we play orchestral music, mm. right? Um, so it's important to, to know that it's not a chamber ensemble, it could be really small groups, but we would, we would never be less than an orchestra. Right. Yeah, that's a, the real distinction between chamber music. Yeah. Uh -huh. Chamber music is usually a few players, I see. maybe up to 10 or so. Chamber orchestra means orchestra. Got it. You know, yeah. different sections of the orchestra, winds, brass, clarinet, little clarinet, winds, uh, percussion, so on, only on a s smaller scale, but still very exciting. Because sure. as I mentioned, um, there's actually more repertory, I think, for chamber orchestra than for large orchestra. Because large orchestra only started coming around the time of Beethoven and further after Beethoven. But look at the whole 17th century, uh, uh, 18th century, and again, many contemporary composers doing things with smaller orchestras. Oh, that's neat. It's great to understand that sort of right. chamber music and, chamber and the orchestra, orchestra, which has to do with the, kind, the number of musicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I didn't know chamber that. is a loaded word that needs to be qualified a little bit in this context. Exactly. <clears throat> okay. Great. And. Uh, that brings me back to something I wanted to say earlier before our break. Uh, we were talking, uh, David was talking about Baroque. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure everybody knows what the implication of that is in terms of musical terms. But uh, if anyone wants to find out what that really is, then come to Messiah. Okay. <laughs> David's Messiah, I hasten to add. All right. Because the Baroque is characterized by dance forms, largely. Right. And therefore, you have the potential for a very lithe, very animated, and very soulful, even morose moods. But the whole gamut of human moods are rendered in this form. Nice. No one is better at that than David and a small orchestra. Mm -hmm. And when you come to Messiah, you'll see what I mean. It's all very animated. It's very up-tempo and up-spirit and joyous, or whatever the mood is, it's very crisply defined, not suffering the, the grossness sometimes of an overly sized chorus and a orchestra. big orchestra. It's a little more of a lumbering kind of a thing, potentially. But here we have the most animated and lightweight, spirited kind of rendition. So it's a matter of style as well. Mm -hmm. I, see. Very nice. I, I remember hearing a recording of Messiah with Sir Thomas Beecham, mm -hmm. who edited it. And he added trombones and cymbals and all kinds of things. Oh, wow, really? It's okay for an outdoor festival, but, but not ideal in Baroque spirit. And that concludes the first part of our series on Rochester Chamber Orchestra. My guests were Tom Paul, who is the board chair, uh, David Fettler, the founding music director of the Chamber Orchestra, and Ariel Dremorite, who is the artistic director. I hope you join us in the second part of our, our conversations with the three of them for the Rochester Chamber Orchestra. I'm Nanette Nokan, and it's about money. Thanks for tuning in to today's show. If you have any questions for It's About Money, please email Nanette at nnocon at aol.com. This program was produced through Penfield Community Television in Penfield, New York.